Charles Darwin is only 22 years old in December 1831 when he boards the Beagle, under the orders of Captain Fitzroy, who's four years his senior. The ship is setting off on an expedition to complete a survey of the coasts of South America. Darwin, fresh out of Cambridge, is the expedition's naturalist. During the voyage, his job will be to collect samples of fauna and flora and to carry out geological observations. The departure from Plymouth is held up by bad weather. The two months we spent in Plymouth were the most miserable of my existence. I was distressed at the idea of leaving family and friends for such a long period, and the weather appeared to me to be unspeakably dismal. I was also disturbed by palpitations and pain in my chest, and convinced that I must have a disease of the heart. I did not consult a doctor, for I feared that I would be declared unfit for the voyage, and I was resolved to leave whatever the cost. Towards midday, on the 27th of December, 1831, the Beagle set sail from Plymouth, heading for South America via Madeira, the Canary Islands, and the Cap Verde Islands. We see the sun rise behind the rugged silhouette of the largest of the Canary Islands. Suddenly, it lights up the peak of Tenerife, while the lower parts of the island are still veiled in a light haze. A delightful first day to be followed by so many others whose memory will never fade. Their first port of call is the volcanic island of San Iago in the Cap Verde Islands. As they arrive in the harbour, Darwin is struck by the sight of a long white strip of rock high up on the dune, which faces the sea. It's made up of fragments of seashells, resting on ancient volcanic rocks. This observation seems to Darwin to lend backing to the theory of the geologist Charles Lyell on the slow change of landscapes. A month and a half later, the Beagle enters the port of Bahia. Darwin prepares to discover the lush Brazilian rainforest. The term delight is nothing like strong enough to express the feelings of a naturalist who for the first time wanders through a Brazilian forest. The elegance of the grasses, the novelty of the parasitic plants, the beauty of the flowers, the brilliant green of the foliage, but above all the general vigour and splendour of the vegetation filled me with admiration. On such a day, whoever loves natural history experiences a pleasure and a joy that is more intense than anything he could ever expect to experience again. Darwin's enthusiasm for Brazil and the beauties of nature is considerably dampened when he comes face to face with the living conditions of the slaves. His position on the question even leads to a violent dispute with Captain Fitzroy, who's an enthusiastic supporter of slavery. At the beginning of April, 1832, the Beagle drops anchor at Rio de Janeiro. Darwin sets off for several days to explore the hinterland and then stays at Botafogo Bay, where he studies the local flora and fauna. On the 5th of July, the ship sets sail for Montevideo in Uruguay. At the end of July, 1832, the Beagle arrives in Montevideo. While the ship begins a survey of the coast, Darwin makes several trips inland. He spends most of his time describing and studying the behavior of the sometimes strange animals that are abundant in the region. At Punta Alta, he spends several weeks collecting the fossilized bones of large extinct mammals. He also meets gauchos, the local cowboys who work wonders with the lasso as they drive their huge herds of cattle across the pampas. All species of animals seem to have been denied by nature to this dry and sandy part of South America. But on the 15th of September in Bahia Blanca, a few animals begin to make their appearance. Then, on the 18th, two weeks before the equinox, everything heralds the beginning of spring. Flowers bloom on the plants that are dotted across the plains, the birds begin to lay their eggs, many insects crawl slowly across the ground and a host of lizards rush in all directions. The animal world is emerging from its torpor. 
On the 27th of November, the ship leaves the port of Montevideo and heads for Tierra del Fuego. Their meeting with the natives is a memorable one. In the region of the islands of Tierra del Fuego, the Beagle weathers a number of storms. The climate is wild and inhospitable. Our meeting with the inhabitants of Tierra del Fuego was the most curious and intriguing sight that I've ever experienced. I had never imagined how vast was the difference that separates savages from civilized men, a difference that is certainly greater than that which exists between wild and domestic animals. The language of this people scarcely deserves to be called articulated language. When one sees these people, one can scarcely believe they are human creatures, inhabitants of the same world as ours. After leaving the three former Fuegan captives in the vicinity of Ponsonby Sound, the Beagle heads towards the Falkland Islands. During his journeys inland, Darwin is intrigued by a number of differences between the species he comes across and those he observed on the South American continent. On the 6th of April, 1833, the Beagle sets sail for the east coast of South America. On the 26th of April, they arrive back in Montevideo. From the end of April to the beginning of December, 1833, Darwin spends all his time on a long series of trips inland, which are full of discoveries and incidents. In the Rio Negro region, he joins in the life of the gauchos, the cowboy farmers of the Pampas. The appearance of the gauchos, these herdsmen who can work wonders with a lasso as they drive their huge herds of cattle across the Pampas, is very striking. Fearsome spurs ring on their heels and the knives they wear at their belts in the manner of daggers give them an air that is most different from that of simple farmers. However, they are extremely well-mannered. <laughs> but whilst they greet you most graciously, they seem quite ready to murder you should the opportunity arise. When he arrives on the banks of the Rio Colorado, Darwin meets the despotic General Rosas and is confronted with bloody fighting between Indians and whites. As he continues to add to his collections of fossils, his observations strengthen his conviction that species are not fixed for all time. On the 6th of December, 1833, the Beagle leaves the port of Montevideo for good heading for the southernmost tip of the continent. When they stop in Patagonia, Darwin unearths the skeleton of a strange pachyderm with the long neck of a llama. This discovery provides him with fresh food for thought about the evolution of species. The explorers pay a second visit to Tierra del Fuego and to the former Fuegan captives. Fitzroy is very disappointed to find that they have returned to their old way of life. In April, Darwin, accompanied by the captain and 20 crew members, sails up the rugged course of the Rio Santa Cruz on board three whaling boats. For 17 days, at the cost of huge effort, the men haul their craft up the river under the discreet watch of the Indians. The descent, however, takes them only three days. On the morning of the 10th of June, we at last enter the Pacific Ocean. The western coast of Tierra del Fuego is made up of absolutely barren hills of sandstone and granite. Some call this place Desolation of the South, and its name is well deserved. The ocean waves unceasingly break on the countless rocks. We sail between the east and west furies to the south of the Milky Way, a passage thus named because it abounds with so many reefs that the sea is always white with foam. Just a glance at such a coast would be enough for anyone who is not accustomed to the sea to set him dreaming for a week about shipwreck, danger and death. From June 1834 to January 1835, Darwin explores the countryside around Valparaiso and the Chiloé and Kronos Islands off the coast of Chile. The islands are battered by gales and covered with boggy, often impenetrable forests. The naturalist makes many observations of the local wildlife the Chiloé fox, beavers, vultures, giant wild rhubarb, Patagonian cypress and fields of fuchsia, among others. 
you experience a great feeling of pleasure on reaching the summit of a mountain, whichever one it may be, in the wild countryside of these Chilean islands. What a feeling of triumph and pride is aroused in the mind by these magnificent landscapes, a feeling that is mixed with a little vanity. You tell yourself that you are perhaps the first man to have set foot on this peak. At the end of January, Darwin witnesses the eruption of Osorno. He learns later that, on the same day, several volcanoes in that part of South America also erupted. On the 4th of February, the explorers leave for Valdivia on the Chilean coast, where they're greeted by an earthquake. On the 20th of February, 1835, at 11.30 a.m., an earthquake hits, the most violent that has ever struck the region of Valdivia in human memory. At Talcahuano, the entire coast is littered with beams and furniture, as if a thousand ships had been wrecked there. As for the island of Kirikina, it appears to have been reduced in size to a greater extent than if the sea and the passage of time had acted upon it for an entire century. In March and April 1835, Darwin undertakes a number of trips into the Andes. The observations made there lead him to conclude that the Andes probably had a marine origin. In mid-July, the Beagle drops anchor in Callao, the port of Lima in Peru. The revolution that has broken out in the country prevents the naturalist from leaving the city. On the outskirts of Lima, the ruins of an Indian village and the various vestiges of this lost civilization arouse his admiration. On the 7th of September, the Beagle leaves the port of Callao and heads due west towards the Galapagos Islands. In September and October 1835, Darwin and his companions explore some of the islands of the Galapagos. Volcanic and arid on the coasts, with lusher vegetation on the peaks, the islands reveal a very special flora and fauna. The energy of the force of creation that is apparent on the small, barren and rocky islands of the Galapagos is astonishing. But even more astonishing is the very different action exerted by this force of creation on islands which are nonetheless very close to one another. For instance, several islands possess their own particular species of tortoises, mockingbirds, finches and plants. This little group of islands off South America is really a small world unto itself. On the 20th of October, the Beagle set sail for Tahiti, over 5,000 kilometres from the Galapagos. The ship arrives in Tahiti in mid-November 1835. Darwin is charmed by the luxuriant countryside and by the warm welcome of the island's inhabitants. On the other hand, he's much less enthusiastic about the inhabitants of New Zealand, and on top of that, he's beginning to feel homesick. They stop off in Australia in January 1836, which enables Darwin to make some surprising encounters, such as with the strange platypus, and to admire Sydney, which greatly impresses him. The inhabitants of Tahiti are charming and intelligent, and their tattoos most elegant. One cannot say the same about the New Zealanders, who are warlike, dirty and considerably less civilised. In their society, murder and the most atrocious crimes reign supreme, although fortunately cannibalism appears to be a dying custom. As for the people of Australia, the only thing that appears to motivate them is money. The country is too large and ambitious for one to like it, and not yet powerful enough for one to respect it. On the 14th of March, the Beagle set sail for the Cocoa Islands, lost in the immensity of the Indian Ocean. On the 1st of April, 1836, the explorers arrive within sight of the coral islands of the Cocos. These islands offer us a magnificent spectacle. What a delight it is to rest in the shade of the coconut palms and drink the milk of their fruit, so cool and pleasant. These coral islands, built by the action of polyps, almost deserve to be called a wonder of the world. It is marvellous to see how the soft, gelatinous bodies of these tiny marine animals conquer, with the help of the laws of life, the immense mechanical power of the ocean's waves. After meticulously observing the coral reefs that form the islands, Darwin concludes that the polyps developed 
on what had once been dry land, which then gradually sunk. Pursuing its voyage, the Beagle arrives in Mauritius on the 29th of April. Darwin finds the island very picturesque, although without the charm of Tahiti or the grand scale of Brazil. On the 9th of May, it's time to leave. The Beagle sets sail from Port Louis and heads towards the Cape of Good Hope at the southernmost tip of South Africa. On the 31st of May, 1836, the Beagle reaches the Cape of Good Hope. The countryside holds no interest for Darwin, who very quickly travels on to Cape Town. There he meets the English astronomer and philosopher Sir John Herschel, who greatly impresses him. On the 8th of July, the expedition reaches the volcanic island of St Helena, which resembles a huge black castle lost in the middle of the South Atlantic. Eleven days later, Darwin visits the desolate island of Ascension. Before the final return to England, Captain Fitzroy decides to return to Bahia in Brazil. The tropical nature of Brazil again fills me with wonder. No words can describe the joy that one feels when contemplating it. The entire countryside is but one immense, lush greenhouse created by nature herself. The European finds here all the splendour of another world. However, as we leave the coast of Brazil behind, I give thanks to God that I will no longer have to visit a country of slavery. My blood boils when I think that we Englishmen have also been guilty of atrocious acts on these poor souls. On the 2nd of October, 1836, the Beagle enters the English port of Falmouth after a voyage which has lasted four years, nine months and five days. The voyage on the Beagle was by far the most important event of my life. It immediately determined the course of my scientific work. It brought me such profound joys that I would recommend that all naturalists attempt such an experience in far-off countries. But to put up with the hardship that this causes, it is necessary to have a goal, and that this goal be a study to be completed or a truth to be unveiled. It is essential that this goal, in a word, sustain you and encourage you. Thank you.